Dr. Santiago, thank you so much. Um, we're, for the rest of the time that we have with you, um, we, we are gonna pose some questions that we hope you can answer for us. Um, I'm gonna begin uh, for us here with some prepared questions, but I would remind everybody uh, tuning in that they can submit questions for Dr. Santiago through the Q&A and I will, uh, I will share those with him. Um, so just to start, uh, in your role in state legislature, Representative Santiago, um, can you tell us a little bit about what serving in that role actually looks like? Sort of what the day to day, sort of what, yeah. what does that look and feel like? And that, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, in the Peace Corps, we used to say it's a 24 hour a day job. And I feel it's similar in the emergency, excuse me, in the um, Beacon Hill, uh, because you have, you know, I, I, really, I typically divide into two different functions. One is the policy uh, function, right? Let's sit around a table, let's meet with advocates, um, stakeholders, and let's come up with policy to become legislation, right? So we could pass a law that could be signed by the House of Representatives, by the Senate, uh, and by the governor to become law, right? So there's that part that I would argue that is it's very intellectually stimulating. And um, if you're curious, if you're smart, if you want to be engaged, it's fascinating. There is also the second part, which is the, the neighborhoods right? And it's the constituency, the people you are there to um, represent, right? So I, as a state representative, I represent parts of South End, Back Bay, Fenway, Roxbury, three, four different neighborhoods with different needs, different desires, um, a host of similarities, but very different. Uh, and so you have to be out there working with them. And a lot of it is constituency work, particularly in the era of COVID. You have a lot of people who've lost jobs, lost services, can't access food. So Corey and I are on the phone quite often uh, with people who say, listen, I lost my job, I need access to unemployment insurance. How can you help me, right? And so I think the second part of that, you know, um, position of the state representative is being very outward facing. You know, obviously in the era of COVID-19, we can't be on the community, but if it wasn't because of COVID-19, I'd be out there knocking on doors, meeting with people face to face. But a lot of this is done virtually on via Zoom now. And so those are really the two functions of, I mean, there are a whole host of functions um, of, you know, state rep, but those are the two, Primary, primarily ones that I think, um, you know, when I think about state representative and what you should be doing, um, that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Aside from that, it's it's a, you know, 8 a.m. in the morning. I mean, you have to really put your hours on it because you could be working nonstop. Um, when it comes to the policy and to the voting, we typically vote one day a week, right? There's an agenda that's put forth by the legislative leadership that says on a Wednesday, we're gonna vote on XYZ bill. And so let's get together on Wednesday as a, as a caucus. Let's discuss this as a, as a House of Representatives. Let's take a vote. Let's debate it. And we'll vote typically one day a week. Um, and then, um, but the constituent stuff, that's, you know, 24 seven. Thank you so much. Um, so switching gears a little bit here, you talked with us about some of the challenges of working in the emergency department um, during COVID-19, especially early on. Um, whether whether it's then or as we went through this past year, can you talk with us about some of what you felt to be the most hopeful moments and all of that? Oh, I, I am I'm a relentless optimist. I mean, I feel you know why I do what I do is because I think the world can be at a better place. I made the decision in the Peace Corps. You know, I, and I, you know, I, I've been someone who's really committed his life to public service, being the Peace Corps, the Army, the ER, and now politics, because I I am ultimately uh, a believer in people. Uh, and believer in um, that the world would become a better place. I made that decision in the Peace Corps, actually. I was sitting in bed, and as, as if anyone knows the Peace Corps, they're very long hours. Uh, you're by yourself um, in a different country. You know, you're, you're lonely at times, and there's a lot of alone time, right? I thought to myself, you know, is the world becoming a better place, like historically speaking, right? And like, in what role can I have in that? And if I thought the answer was yes, well, then I'm gonna commit to my life to making sure the world can be a better place. And so I ultimately said yes. And so um, in my work in the emergency department, uh, obviously it's a difficult place. I work at the safety and hospital where a lot of the patients are poor, they lack health care. Um, they've been suffering for a long time and they can't get care and they only come when they need an emergency. And oftentimes, you know, unfortunately that might result in death or some sort of negative outcome where that's gonna significantly uh, be detriment to, to their, their livelihood. And so, it's challenging for sure. Um, and so a part of being an emergency room doctor is not getting too high or too low because you could be taking care, let's say of a gunshot, uh, an 18 year old guy who's been shot. Um, and then literally, literally five minutes later, you could be taking care of someone who's been having a foot problem for five years. And then five minutes later, another gunshot wound. So the point is to stay cool, calm and collected 
um, and to find moments where you can, you know, take some hope. And I have, I have a tremendous amount of optimism because I see the work that the nurses and the physicians and the medical techs do each and every day. They're just commitment to helping people, you know. Uh, we know at night, sometimes in the overnight shift, we get a significant amount of homeless patients that come into the hospital. And sometimes their issues aren't, you know, acute in nature. I mean, they're chronic, you know, they want a place to sleep, um, some food. And I think those couple of minutes where we could talk to them about, listen, you know, um, here's a sandwich, here's, here's, a, here's some respite, here is uh, some services that maybe we can connect you with to address whatever, if you're having substance use issues or lack of housing that we can help you with. And, you know, there's something about the instant gratification of being in the emergency department that really, you know, excites me and drives me. Because at the end of the day, you know, why I got why I became a physician is because I got sick and tired of being in these boardrooms and talking about poverty and talking about these big issues. So I wanted to do something, and that's why I did it. But I, I still find hope in in the patients that I see, um, whether it's a substance use uh, patient who you know I, I'll see walking down the street and it's like, well, I've been clean for six months, um, and that gets me excited for a whole day. So what I try to do each and every day is try to find one story um, in my personal life or something that I read about just to get me going for the day. And, uh, you know, I usually do that. And then, you know, it gives me up energy for the day. But in this world of tragedy and, dip and sadness, um, it could be challenging for sure. But, uh, you know, my advice would be just to keep on trucking along and it'll get better. Thank you so much. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, your, your deployment to the Middle East with the Army um, during last fall into the winter. Um, and I know you were deployed uh, with the army in a specific area of, of the world, but um, I'm wondering if, if that experience afforded you any sense of uh, what life is like living in this pandemic in different parts of the world. We, we read about that, but you know, because none of us have been able to travel, um, the firsthand experience of that is, is, is not something that we've all been afforded. I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, I was in Kuwait. So typically when you, you're with the army, you're, you're, it's like you fly out and I don't know if uh, Aaron and Carrie, you, you're in the, you've served in the military before if you have been deployed, but you typically work on a base and so you're, you're almost sequestered from you know, the country. Um, one time I did go out, typically you can go out, you know, if, um, if things were pre-COVID, um, but most of the time you spent on the base. And so just treating and working with American soldiers and, you know, you know, obviously, you know, the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan have, you know, have uh, slowed down significantly. And so casualties weren't too high, but I will say that there was a COVID, uh, you know, outbreak there. And so we were taking care of a lot of COVID-19 patients. I mean, if you can remember, um, you know, the, the, um, the pandemic of, uh, you know, of the early that 20th century, it, it was transmitted because of the military. Because if you think about it, a lot of people are living in these confined spaces, right? And they still are, even in COVID-19. And so there's not a day that went by there that I was taking care of soldiers who had COVID-19. Now, many of them were young and healthy. Um, but what I will say about, you know, your, your point, um, Aaron, is, is well taken about, I'm getting to know the parts of the world and the importance of that. You know, my five years abroad taught me so much about myself and about the world and about people um, and that we have a lot more in common than we think we do, right? And similar in this army experience, you know, you know you're taking care of soldiers from all over the world, all over the country, you know? And so when I would take care of someone, they're typically 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and they're from small villages, small you know, towns all over, you know, population 200 out in Indianapolis. Or, or, or in all these rural states, and I would sit down and talk with them, and we would be very different, politically speaking per se, or ideas about progress and about uh, you know COVID or whatever. But it was always an interesting experience to sit down with them, to engage them, to learn from them. You know, again, I feel fundamentally that we have a lot more in common um, than we do, and you know what strikes me difficult in this world today, given the polarization on from Washington D.C. on down. Is that you know maybe uh, flamed by the the Twitter sphere or social media? Is that you know we do fundamentally have a lot more in common than we do. And if we did, if there is a level of respect, uh, a level of you know uh, engagement that we can really traverse some of these very complex problems we have here. And that's been my experience as a community organizer in the army and as an ER doctor as well. And that's what I hope to bring to to politics. And you know, I've only been doing it for three years, but I think. You know, being able to reach across the aisle, being able to speak with people um, from a different background. I think that's um, how we are able to, you know, uh, answer these very difficult problems in today's world.
Thank you so much. I have a couple of questions that have come in here from students that I'd like to get to if I can. Um, this is a question from James McCurley, who's a sophomore. Um, James asks, what specific policies would you put in place to combat COVID-19 if you were mayor of Boston? Well, I think the key to getting over this nightmare is, um, is a term called herd immunity. Um, and that's the idea where there are enough people vaccinated where the virus will begin to just you know, no longer propagate in community, right? And so the only way you get to herd immunity and the number changes here and there is by vaccinating people, right? And so the estimates range for anywhere to 70 to 85% of people need to be vaccinated, inoculated in order to get the herd immunity. And so my goal, you know, not just as a candidate for mayor, but also as, as, as a state rep as a position is to get as many people vaccinated as soon as possible, right? Um, and it's just not, and it shouldn't be just a number game. It shouldn't be just like, the U.S. government gives you 100, 130,000 vaccinations per or doses per week. Um, it should also entail some level of equity as well. And so, my goal is to be as innovative, you know, and has, uh, you know, focused on that. And I'll give you an example. Here in the South End, where I live, um, we have a community that's very, uh, at times, very wealthy, but at times very poor. Um, there's a 30-year life expectancy from the district that I represent if I walk from one end to another, right? So there are a whole host of inequities within that, right? My guess, you know, and I think the literature bears this out, is that if you're poor, if you happen to be a person of color, you know, if you happen to be disabled, if you happen to be very elderly, you probably don't have the same access as a person who is mobile, who can drive to Gillette, who can drive to Fenway, whatever. You. And so over the course of these past couple of weeks, we've put together a plan with some local stakeholders, and it's not super public yet, so I won't give too many ideas or too, many, too much information about how do we get those hardest hit populations, particularly in the Boston Housing Authority buildings, some of those older people of color, less mobile people, right? And we did this by bringing stakeholders together to get them vaccinated. And so number one, let's get folks vaccinated. Let's get, let's get uh, students back to school. Uh, let's get this economy up and roaring again. And, um, but to me, that's what I think has to be, you know, first and foremost thing, let's get folks vaccinated. Let's begin to, you know, address, um, um, the, these underlying issues. I want to say one thing that an, uh, an issue that's come up that in the emergency room that I've seen um, in a way that's uh, it's been manifested in a very real way is the, the mental health crisis, right? Um, it's been a crisis long before COVID-19. And, you know, it's just uh, it, astonishing to see that the number of people with depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal thoughts, um, and we see them in the emergency department because that's op often where they come through how that has risen um, in, in young people, um, but in, in older people as well. And that's something that we need to address as well. But again, let's get folks vaccinated and um, let's get folks, uh, let's get life back to normal. Thank you. Um, my next question here is from Ethan Fan, who's a senior. And this is sort of on the tail of, of the answer that you just provided for us. Um, and Ethan's question is, uh, you said COVID-19 has blown up inequities already present in our society. Um, if you were mayor, what policies would you implement to address these inequities in the city? Uh, that, that's a great question, Ethan. Thank you. I, I think what excites me about this race for mayor is that, you know, it's not just about looking. Listen, I'm a, I'm the COVID-19 doctor coming to you know address COVID-19 in the city of Boston, right? And my hope is one day COVID-19 will be a memory, a distant memory. My life's practice has been about inequity and how we address them, right? Not just the medicine or healthcare, but my work in the Peace Corps uh, as a community organizer, working with some of the poorest people on the island. And so I think when we look at inequity, we really have to look at the structural um, issues there, right? You know, because before COVID-19 was here, as I said, and as Ethan's question noted, that there's been inequity. So, you know, when I think about the education system, I think about, you know, making sure that each kid um, has the opportunity to succeed, right? You know, when I think about myself uh, growing up in Boston for a number of years, I was one of these, one of these kids, uh, students from a family that wasn't necessarily as educated as other families from a family who grew up in a poor part of town, right? And I think there's so much untapped potential in those neighborhoods that I want to, I want to give them every opportunity in the world. And so what gets me going, I'll give you an example, Ethan. You know, there is a roaring life sciences uh, industry um, that is still, despite the epidemic, um, still looking to invest and to engage. And so I, you know, what gets me excited at night when I go to sleep sometimes and my wife is like, why are you smiling? Uh, because I think about, you know, building a 21st century economy here in Boston is really focused on the biotech life sciences industry, using our competitive advantage, whether that's the healthcare industry, the Harvard or the MIT, whatever, and to bring this industry here, you know, creating the modernas of the future, right? And so that's a great thing in terms of jobs, not just scientists, 
not just doctors getting involved there, but the biomanufacturing as well, right? And all the people that need to be involved in that supply chain. But what's interesting to me is like the synergy between that economy and also the education K through 12. If it wasn't for a five week summer program I did when I was 19 years old, that plucked poor black and brown kids from, you know, from wherever and engage them in science and medicine, I wouldn't be a physician today. A five week summer program, right? And I think the opportunity to give students and young folks those, those similar types of opportunities because of a thriving economic engine, in this case, life sciences, can really change their attitude and can really open up their, um, you know, their opportunity to succeed. And so being innovative, um, investing in that, you know, things like universal pre-K, I mean, starting at the, at the youngest of ages would be my kind of goal um, as the mayor of Boston. Thank you so much. I have a couple more student questions here. Um, this is from Ben Crawford, who's also a senior. And Ben's question is, given the difficult nature of your work in the ER, in the army, and as a politician, have you ever felt your optimism falter? And how do you oh. handle those moments? Oh, that's a great question. You know, yeah, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. Um, and, and, and the short answer is that that's life. You know, um, you know, it's life is very difficult and I feel blessed. I feel healthy. I feel that I have a roof over my head. And so I, I tried to balance this with, uh, you know, there are hard times in the hospital. You know, I, I, I cry with patients and families all the time. Um, and I have to take a couple of minutes to take a step back and, and put it all into perspective. And I think what I try to do, and, and this is something I've been doing since I was about uh, 20 years old. Um, you know, I, I try to take, take it all into perspective, right? Like things are challenging, um, but things could get worse, right? Um, I'm just blessed that I'm in a position to help people. And every time, you know, and I, listen, I failed a number of times, you know, I'm a big sports guy, you know, I, and I, you know, basketball is my first love. And uh, Michael Jordan, it always talks about like, you know, the reason why I succeed is because I fail, right? And I think if you look at failure as a way to improve oneself, not as just like, listen, you, you messed up, uh, you've done a bad thing, but if you look at failure as a, an opportunity to rise above that, and have you have that perspective, um, that to me, that's the key to succeed in life, whatever. So I, I still make mistakes and I'm very open about that. Like I still don't have the answer. Uh, I still walk in the emergency room sometimes with a complicated case in front of me and I don't know what to do. You know, I mean, I've done all what I can, but the person's heart's not beating again. So I'll step back and I'll say, listen, I don't have the answer right now, but together in partnership with my team, we can get there, right? And that's how I go about medicine. That's how I go about governing. That's how I go about politics. It's like together, we're actually stronger than we are uh, as separate individuals. So I think taking, to, taking into account perspective um, uh, is, what helped, is what helped guide me you know, over the past 20 years or so um, since I you know, entered adult life and graduated high school, um, but also you know, working in collaboration with people, right? Because I can't do this by myself. You know, I depend on my wife, my friends, my colleagues, and they lift me up, I lift them up. And having a stable relationship and, and depending on those relationships and those friendships, I mean, that's, gonna be, that's what's gonna keep you going. Thank you. I have a question here um, from Nick Rossidi. Um, and Nick's question is, um, in popular culture, politics often has a negative stigma as being a dog eat dog competition where many politicians try to do things for their own political advantage or are prevented from doing the quote, right thing by political forces. In your experience, does this perception hold weight? What about politics frustrates you and what do you find most rewarding about it? That's a, you know, uh, Nick's right. I mean, I think for, for, you know, people are frustrated with politics nowadays. You turn on the TV, whether it's CNN, whether it's MSNBC or Fox News, and it could be incredibly frustrating. Um, and I've had my own run-ins with elected officials and politicians. And, and I have to ask myself sometimes, like, you know, why are you doing this? Or, you know, are, are we really in this that, you know, help move society forward to help people? Um, but the bottom line is, is like politics is, is a very uh, tough uh, sport. Um, it's not one for um, the week. Uh, you know, when you walk into some of these community meetings, I mean, people want to eat you alive sometimes. And so there's an important part to be, you know, to just take it, again, take, take it into perspective. Um, at the end of the day, politics comes down to, there's the policy, which I think a lot of us enjoy and like to talk about, how do we pass these progressive pieces of legislation? And then there's the politics, right? Um, and I think uh, politics is about how do you get the votes and how do you convince people, persuade people that your way is the right way? 
Um, there, there's a there's a great book by John F. Kennedy, which I'm drawing a blank right now. I won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, oh, Profiles and Courage, right? And Profiles and Courage talks about it gives um, I think seven or eight different profiles of certain political figures in our country's history um, that have stood up, uh, you know, against uh, what was politically the popular thing to do because they thought it was the right thing to do. And so when I read that book and I found it quite interesting. And I said, listen, you can be an elected official and stand up for your values. And, I, and at times you might need to pay the political price, but are you willing to you know, stand up and do the right thing for what you feel is morally correct to do? But the preface of the book, John Kennedy talks about you know, why people vote on certain things. You know? And he gives three reasons why people vote, just the elected official. You vote for things for three different reasons. You vote for things as one, you believe in them as, as an individual person. Number two, you vote for things because this is what your community wants, right? So I represent 42,000 people uh, you know, in my district, right? If the 42,000 people wanted um, Proposition A to move forward, and I individually thought Proposition B should move forward, well, I should, you know, I need to weigh that um, into account. The third, the third part is a bit more political. It's about your future political success. So in the preface of the book, John F. Kennedy talks about these three things. And there's never one exact formula. It's always a mix of each of the three, right? And depending on the situation and the context. And so it's a lot more complicated than, you know, um, I'm going to be voted for this because I feel like it's the right thing to do, right? I mean, you have to really be playing chess while some people are playing checkers, um, if, if you get what I mean by that. That's not to say that, you know, you don't have to compromise on your values. Um, but I, but you have to understand that I think politics, it was, the, it was in America, at least, in our democracy, you know, it was defined as a compromise, right? Like, let's move the ball forward. And I have that, I often have a quote where I say, and it's not, not my quote, it's, you know, taken from people like, you know, Voltaire, who said, let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good, right? Like, I have all these great ideas and I want to get them through, right? But if I can't get the votes on Beacon Hill, like, it's not going to go through, right? So if I can get a little bit of piece of the pie and live to fight another day, well, I'm going to do that. Um, and you'll meet people on the political spectrum who are not willing to do that, you know? Um, and so, but I want to keep on pushing the ball forward. And um, that's kind of my approach to politics. Thank you. And I have one final question really quickly here before we, before we sign off. Um, you do a lot of really important things seemingly simultaneously. <laughs> um, you wear a lot of hats. And I'm wondering um, what advice you would give to somebody who is looking to do that very thing to sort of commit in a lot of different directions. Yeah, uh, you, know, it, you know, I think if I'm talking to to teenagers right now, um, you know, my I was very similar when I was your age. Uh, my dad, I'd walk into my house and my dad would say, like, John, what, like, what is your plan today? It's like, what are you doing? And, um, you know, and I would, and it was frustrating early on because my, you know, I guess, you know, I have a lot, I have a lot of interest, obviously, and a big curiosity. Um, and I wanted, I surrounded myself purposely by people who also shared similar interests, right? Because um, the fact of the matter, there are a lot of haters in this world, right? There will be people who will tell you, you can't do this. That Listen, you couldn't go to college. You couldn't go to med school. Why are you going to the Peace Corps? It's wasting your time. You can't beat a 40-year incumbent. You know, you shouldn't be running for mayor, you know? And, you know, we make a life out of kind of proving people wrong, not because we want to prove people wrong, but because we believe in ourselves. We believe in helping others and we believe in serving and I think ultimately, you know, you got to find out what, like, what your mission in life is about. And I know that's a lot for a 16, 17, 8 year old person to do. And for me, I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I kind of found that I wanted to serve people. You know, um, I we talk about this very much, but you know, I don't um, go to church every Sunday, but I consider myself somewhat, uh, you know, religious. You know, I study religious studies, as, as as Gary said, and there's a part of me that looks at the the historical figure of Christ per se as a role model, the idea where a man would literally give his shirt off the back to you, right? Um, to me, that's like the ultimate example. Um, and so I thought, you know, if I could live my life as a service and to give back to people, like that's going to keep on guiding me. And that's going to be my North Star. And so I think my, my advice would be to find your North Star, find what gets you going, find what energizes you, and, you know, and find what gets you up every day to, serve, to in my case, to serve folks. And to just and just to do it, and, and people are going to hate, hate, and hate, and that's a part of life. Um, but as long as you stay, you know, laser focused, I mean, you're going to get through it, and there are going to be some failures, and, and fail, failure is a good thing. Failure is a good thing, and I think not not a lot of people want to hear that today. But I'm not where I am today if I wasn't for all the failures that I've had, and I've had plenty of them. Um, and so, again, I think this is the last question. Uh, but I just want to say, Aaron and, and Carrie, thank you so much for allowing me to come speak to. 
to your students. Um, you know, uh, perhaps we'll be meeting each other on the campaign trail or, you know, once COVID is kind of, uh, we're all vaccinated. I mean, I got my vaccinations, but we have a, lot, we have a long way to go. Um, but I just want to thank you for taking the time to, to sit down with us and start this conversation and um, and happy to, you know, continue it um, uh, later on, hopefully. Dr. Santiago, thank you so much for being with us for your wisdom and more important for your example. I think that um, it's likely that someday you, you'll be the next chapter in JFK's Profiles and Courage. And I will also say that I'll, I'll make it possible for 309 boys in the school to volunteer for your campaign. So we'll put them in touch with your website and see how all of that works. And I would also uh, ask you, you don't have to answer directly right now, but when you are elected mayor, I hope that Roxbury Latin will be one of the first stops that you make after that. So you can see us all in person and we you, can celebrate you can, that. You, you, listen, that would be the, the only campaign promise I'm committed to 110% right now. <laughs> and if you still like to win uh, the mayor uh, the mayor seat, you can definitely count me in. Um, but I would tell folks if they want to get involved in the campaign that, listen, politics is a noble profession. Yeah, don't let anyone tell you that. It's like, listen, I know that the news and there's certain politicians, but the, the notion that you can improve the life of your brother and your sister um, through through political means. I mean, that's what this is all about. That's how, as a as a as a Puerto Rican person, uh, you know, I've been able to like some people have extended a hand to me and have provided resources. That's how my father was able to. You know, we've made progress in this country and in the city and the state. It hasn't been perfect. Sometimes it's three steps forward, two steps back, but that's how progress is made. So I want to invite each and every one of you to get involved politically, to register to vote. When I was 18, I didn't register to vote and I missed my first vote, you know? I thought, oh, politics is like, you know, it's all corrupt, it's all whatever. Um, but it's, it, it is what it is because not enough people are engaged. And so if you get engaged, you can change that. And so uh, thank you again for taking the time to, to sit down with me and, and, and listen to me speak about uh, my interests and my background, but I'm looking forward to meeting you guys in person in the near future. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks guys.